in this lecture, um, we will get rid of the boring stuff, um, such as uh, abiotic conditions in the tropics, so that uh, we can then go to the more interesting uh, issues. So, first, uh, we have to we have to realize how large uh, are the tropics. Um, it's a bit deceptive um, uh, based on the maps we are using because uh, we are used to a Mercator projection and that is uh, distorting the actual size of the land area. Uh, the more um, we go away from the tropics, the uh, large the distortion is. And so the tropics appear very small compared to especially uh, land areas of the Northern temperate zone. Um, here, uh, this is the actual uh, land area as shown by Mercator projection. And uh, on the right side is the much better equal area projection uh, showing that um, the tropics are much bigger than, than we could sort of uh, perceive uh, from Mercator maps. Um, this is a excellent example of a historical constraint. Uh, we are using Mercator uh, projection because we um, uh, are accustomed to it. And um, uh, it made actually sense in the past because um, when you are trying to uh, translate uh, the globe to a two-dimensional piece of paper, then uh, there is a certain distortion is inevitable. And you can either distort um, the land areas or you can distort directions. So Mercator projection has the advantage of um, if you follow northern direction, um, then uh, it will map as a straight line on, on Mercator map. And that was uh, very important before uh, we had all the GPS and uh, other orientation devices. Nowadays, it would be much better to have equal area projection, but you know, habit is habit. So um, to illustrate this uh, big difference, this is the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, how it is shown uh, on Mercator projection uh, in its original place. Um, then translated to Europe and then to Scandinavia. So basically very few people realize that um, the Democratic Republic of Congo um, uh, is actually almost as big as uh, the entire European um, continent. Certainly certainly a combination of uh, France, uh, Germany, Poland, Central Europe and Italy. So when we look at the real land area uh, of the tropics, uh, that means uh, approximately between uh, between uh, 20 degrees of uh, south and north, then uh, yes, temperate zone uh, is still bigger, but, uh, but the tropical areas is, uh, are quite large, which of course has biological consequences because one of the basic rules is that the number of species incre is increasing with, with land area. So, um, so there are consequences of the size. Um, regarding the climate, um, tropics are hot, which is uh, perhaps not a big surprise, but when we look at um, the map of um, uh, the map showing uh, the areas of the same temperature by five, five degrees centigrade, then clearly the tropical area between 25 and 30 degrees of mean annual temperature is the widest belt on the map. So again, um, there is a um, large area of uh, constant temperature and that is in the tropics. Um, the reason for that, uh, when you see the mean temperature, it's uh, linearly increasing with latitude, uh, but then um, that function is not a peak, but there is a plateau uh, around the equator. And so uh, there is a, and then decrease again in, in the southern hemisphere. So um, there is a there is a large area with the constant temperature, not only because the northern and southern tropics are adjacent, uh, unlike other zones, but also because of this uh, of, of this flat curve. Um, the temperature range uh, between maximum and minimum temperature is uh, pretty much mirror-like image to the mean annual. Uh, temperature again with, with a plateau with very small uh, variation in the tropics. 
However, mean annual temperature is not an uh, ideal measure of temperature for biologists because um, when you think of uh, winters, for instance, uh, whether there are minus 20 or minus uh, 40 degrees of Celsius, that of course usually affects uh, mean annual temperature, but it may not be uh, really important for, for biology if most of the species are dormant during the winter. So we are preferring annual growing degree days uh, which is basically the biologically meaningful temperature. That means temperature meaningful for plant growth, for photosynthesis. Uh, this is um, um, from ecophysiology. This is the relationship uh, between leaf temperature and photosynthetic rate for different types of plants, but we will not worry about it. Uh, the annual growing degree days basically represent a very rough approximation by, by a straight line starting at uh, five degrees of Celsius, um, assuming that temperature be below that are not really relevant, nothing is happening at these temperatures. So at five degrees Celsius, um, there is a straight straight relationship between photosynthesis and, um, and um, temperature. Of course, then it declines again at extremely high temperatures, but again, that's ignored here. So uh, the annual growing degree days are calculated as number of days during the year times daily mean temperature minus um, uh, five degrees Celsius. So basically uh, daily mean temperature above uh, five degrees of Celsius, um, uh, anything below five degrees uh, contributes zero to, to annual growing degree days. And so this is the map which shows ideal temperature for plants, which of course sometimes is spoiled by the lack of water. But in terms of plant growth, this should be the most uh, productive areas temperature wise. Now regarding the rainfall, um, here when we look at the uh, picture of the globe, um, we see a conspicuous um, uh, belt of uh, clouds along the equator and that is so-called intertropical conver convergence zone. Um, how it originates? Uh, basically the Equatorial climate means uh, means high temperature, so the air is getting warm. That means it uh, raises to high elevation, where it cools down, and because uh, it's full of water, uh, then that water falls out from from the clouds as rainfall, and then as the air cools down, becomes heavier, and then descends uh, back uh, to the earth, and the whole process is repeated. So that's called so-called Hadley. Uh, cell and uh, this is the circulation both from the south and from the north which is maintaining the intertropical convergence zone as as the place of intense rainfall and clouds this is how it looks on the satellite pictures and of course we have seasonality and so the convergence zone is not stationary but uh, in uh, uh, the North, northern, uh, northern summer goes to the north and then turns down, uh, passes the equator and goes to the to the south again in uh, in uh, uh, in the uh, northern northern winter. And so uh, these are the positions uh, in July and January. And so you can see that in many areas there would be uh, two transitions of uh, convergence uh, zone every year, and that corresponds to two wet seasons in the areas northern uh, and uh, further north and further south, then there will be just one um, visitation of convergence zone. And so that means one rainy season. So this is the schematic representation of, um, of that principle. And here you can see that, of course, the configuration of continents again influences the convergence zone. So it's not a straight line. So that's, uh, that's one um, uh, factor uh, defining the rainfall in the tropics. Another one is monsoons. Um, the principle of monsoon is basically that uh, water has uh, higher uh, thermal capacity. And so water um, needs uh, more energy to heat uh, by one degree of Celsius and then also to, um, uh, and then also loses that temperature more slowly. So the air, above the land heats faster. And so in the, in the summer, uh, the hot air above the continent uh, raises up and then the uh, 
colder and therefore heavier uh, air from above the ocean uh, gets to its place and brings, uh, brings water uh, above the continent and uh, that water condensates and falls down as monsoon rainfalls. So the prevailing um, direction of winds in the summer is from ocean to the continent, uh, while there is a exactly opposite uh, pattern in the winter where um, the land uh, cools faster than ocean and therefore, um, therefore the relatively hotter air above the ocean goes up and uh, the dry uh, air from the continent uh, uh, goes to the ocean. So, so that monsoon is dry. So the monsoon um, dynamics is, is another rainfall pattern. And then there is a pattern of um, steady rainfall in the narrow equatorial zone. So when we combine these uh, patterns together, this is um, how the tropics look like. So it's, it's certainly not a uniform situation. Uh, we can see that uh, there is this um, equatorial steady rainfall, which includes especially Southeast Asia, the entire New Guinea, Borneo, uh, Java, and then uh, Peruvian Amazon. Um, there we have monsoon dynamics uh, in uh, parts of uh, Southeast Asia and, and also other parts of the tropics, including uh, including the neotropics, and then we have the, the dry and wet seasons uh, driven by intertropical uh, convergence zone. So um, that uh, generally translates also in increasing seasonality of rain with latitude. So uh, again, you have some uh, climate, uh, climate diagrams here with pretty much uh, steady uh, rain, or if not steady, then, then sufficient rain without any uh, any really dry season uh, on the equator. Singapore is example of extremely steady rainfalls, but also, also Borneo or New Guinea, uh, even in the what we can call a relatively dry season, there is uh, sufficient um, uh, rainfall for the vegetation. And then when we go towards north, we see increasing uh, seasonality of rainfall, the same when we go towards tropical Australia in this example. Another factor, again, independent from, from the others is El Nino. Uh, that is specific to the Pacific. And um, in the Pacific, we have something like, uh, uh, something like um, uh, longitudinal, uh, we have something like longitudinal Hadley cell. Basically, um, there is a steady wind uh, coming typically from the Americas towards the Asia, which drives uh, warm water, uh, to uh, towards Australia, New Guinea, and Asia uh, forms the warm pool of water there, which means more evaporation, and uh, that means more rain. So, so typically, and then when the when uh, when the air uh, again cools down and then rain falls out of it, then the colder air is returning uh, above the America. So this kind of circulation happens uh, under the normal year, and that means that rainfalls mostly fall in uh, Southeast Asia, New Guinea, Australia region. But occasionally, um, and we don't really know the exact mechanisms of that, um, that pattern breaks. And so um, the heaviest rainfalls uh, fall above the ocean. Basically, the, the circulation is gone and then the water evaporates from the middle of the Pacific, uh, the air goes up and then cond water condensates and rainfall falls down again. So El Nino is not um, a change in rainfall. It's a, it's a redistribution of rainfall. There is a, the same amount of rainfall, but um, instead of falling over Southeast Asia, it falls uh, right in the middle of the Pacific. And that's why we perceive it as a, as a dry, dry period um, because nobody cares about middle of the Pacific. Um, it also manifests as, uh, as different gradients in water temperature. Here uh, in the normal year, you see um, significantly warmer waters uh, towards the Southeast Asia, while that pattern breaks uh, in, in the El Nino year. El Nino happens unpredictably on average every four or five years, but um, it's certainly not, not any kind of a regular event. And also the strengths of El Nino differ. 
Um, of course, uh, because of its effect on uh, climate, there is a lot of interest in El Nino and predicting El Nino. This is example from an Australian uh, website, which has um, neutral watch alert and uh, actual event for, uh, for El Nino. And you can see that in many cases, they have uh, alert uh, for El Nino with no El Nino following. So, so even now, even short term, prediction is very difficult. And these alerts for El Nino, they are only very short term before the actual El Nino starts. So, so there is no long term prediction. Nobody knows what will happen in uh, 2022, for instance, whether we will have, have El Nino or not. Um, when we look at really strong uh, El Nino events, then uh, we had one in 2015. And then before that, uh, even stronger one was 1997. Uh, that's kind of um, typical. Uh, having El Nino every 20 years is, is again what, um, what uh, is to be expected, but certainly not regular. Uh, this is example of the uh, ocean temperature anomalies in 1997-8 El Nino. So uh, the red color means that water is warmer than usual and the blue one that it's colder. And so as we said, uh, there is typically a pool of warm water over the Southeast Asia, which is no longer there because of El Nino. And so we have a negative temperature anomaly here. Pretty much the same pattern happened uh, in 2015. The direct effect of El Nino then is, um, is uh, change in rainfall. And here you have the anomalies in rainfall um, with uh, the dark color is the lack of rainfall and green color is excessive rainfall. Um, and then in the graphs uh, on the left is the observed rainfall in very strong El Nino 1997. And on the left is a typical rainfall. So you can see the differences can be huge. It can be multiple of, um, uh, of the existing uh, standard uh, uh, rainfall. So, so the effect is quite significant. And it's hard to study if you have a typical research grant for years, you can't really write it all on, on El Nino because you never know whether it will happen during your grant. And for really strong El Nino, you have about one in six or one in seven chance uh, to actually happening. Um, in 2015, um, the British uh, Science Foundation, um, for instance, um, funded special uh, research program for El Nino but actually the funding came late when, uh, when El Nino was already gone. So it, it's very hard uh, for our grant system of uh, research funding to adjust to studying El Nino. Um, El Nino is also connected with fires. Again, uh, these are uh, typical uh, fire patterns in normal year. As you can see, savannas in uh, Africa especially uh, have fire as a standard part of the ecosystem dynamics, so not to worry about it. Um, the graph, the, the map below is again the anomalies, either um, increased or decreased uh, frequency of fires. So it looks like even uh, the neotropics and, and uh, southern Africa had extra fires, but then especially southern Borneo, Java and Southeast Asia had extra fires. These fires can be partly natural, you know, the, the lighting can, can start a fire, but uh, they are overwhelmingly uh, caused by people. And um, it's because uh, they are actually waiting for El Nino as an opportunity to get rid of the forest. You can't burn uh, a rainforest in, in, a, in a constantly humid area, like in Borneo, for instance, even if you try, unless there is El Nino. And so, Lots of both small farmers and big uh, agriculture companies are unfortunately waiting for their opportunity. Uh, and during the El Nino, they are intentionally starting fires and, um, and um, uh, clearing the land because of that. Even in areas where um, it's forbidden, you know, if, you, uh, if the fire happens, then you know, uh, the best you can do on the destroyed forest is to maybe start an oil palm plantation, maybe even get environmental certification for that, who knows. Um, but without fire, that would not be possible. Then there is also a sort of mirror-like, completely opposite effect of La Nina, which means extra rainfall. Um, and again, you can see some 
um, sea surface uh, anomalies in the Pacific with La Nina, which is sort of completely opposite to El Nino. But La Nina is actually much less prominent in media and our thinking, because if you have a humid tropics, then extra rainfall makes a little difference. You know, if there is already excess water for entire year for vegetation, then pouring more water on, on you know, the plants is not going to make difference unless, uh, unlike um, having an uh, unusual drought. El Niños can be actually quite important for the forest because when you think of strong El Niños, um, it's 20 years, so, so that's not, not, not frequent enough for your PhD thesis research, but it's frequent enough to shape life histories of trees because uh, for a typical life, uh, lifetime, uh, a tree in the El Niño era is definitely likely to experience at least one or, or maybe several strong El Niños. Now, even the humid area, which don't really suffer any lack of uh, water any time during the year, um, have some variability in rainfalls. This is example from, from uh, Borneo, um, from Gunung Molo. You can see the landscape there. And um, these are daily rains for half a year. And you can see that although it rains always, um, it rains to a very different extent uh, on daily basis. And there can be some very heavy rains where you have uh, 300 millimeters uh, falling within 24 hours. And these rains have some ecological consequences, especially because they happen uh, over the landscape, which is already fully satur saturated with water. And so that means all these uh, rainwater goes straight to the streams, and that means that streams are hugely um, uh, variable in terms of water level. These rains, uh, even small <coughs> small streams, can be going up and down by several meters, which of course means that the vegetation along the streams can be swept away uh, during these huge rains. And so often you see strips of secondary vegetation along the streams as a result of this disturbance. This is an example of a stream with a makeshift um, um, bridge made by the logging company from logs uh, over, over it and how it was completely destroyed by a recent flood uh, as a consequence of one of these rains. Um, this is something which uh, somebody living in Europe does not see, uh, you know, doesn't, um, is not familiar with. Basically, we are not used to this kind of huge variation in, in the water level. Um, when I was first trekking in, in New Guinea, and then um, in one, one day um, uh, it started raining and our local guides started to be very anxious to cross the stream, which, which um, uh, we were following. And I was not really clear what, what's, the, what's the hurry, uh, but in 20, 30 minutes of the rain, I, I saw that that stream uh, very, very, very tame at the beginning became completely impossible to cross um, simply because of these fast changes in uh, rainfall induced uh, water level. Um, we also had a boat um, uh, parked um, on the sea coast and that boat sunk simply because um, we had uh, 30 centimeters of rain overnight and the boat simply sunk because the rain filled it up and, and uh, it went underwater. Again, something which we normally don't expect to happen in Europe. Now, this is the same location with uh, daily records of temperature for one year, um, minimum, mean and maximum temperature. And you can see that if you travel to Borneo, then in your first 24 hours, you basically experience the entire range of temperature you are to expect for, for the whole year. So the, the difference between the night minimum and, and day maximum uh, encompasses the entire variation for, for, for the next year. Okay, these are latitudinal gradients in, um, in rainfall where we can see again latitudinal gradient from lower rainfall in the north and south going to, uh, increasing towards the tropics. Uh, however, this is, um, in itself not entirely biologically informative because um, with the rainfall we have to also look at um, what is the um, what is the way how the water disappears that means what is the um, what is the evaporation and transpiration from that region um, in the so when we when you look at evaporation minus precipitation we still get uh, 
the pattern of humid tropics, but it's, it's slightly more realistic. The variability of the rain, again, that might be a statistic which doesn't tell you much uh, biologically because if you have uh, lots of rain, that means you know, large values of daily rainfall, then you can have a lot of variability. You can have, in, uh, you can have um, um, you know, index of var variance very high, but may not be biologically really very relevant because if there is enough rainfall already, no matter what happens, then some extra rainfall one day and, and missing rainfall another day doesn't really make much difference. So again, um, we are at um, search for some biologically meaningful measure of rain and that is so-called evapotranspiration. That is how fast um, the uh, water gets uh, out of the landscape either by means of evaporating from, uh, from surfaces or transpiration from, from the living plants. And so it's, it's uh, measured in millimeters exactly as rainfall and this is the evapotranspiration um, across the <clears throat> across the globe and um, so when for the evapotranspiration you can have the real evapotranspiration the actual evapotranspiration which is also constrained by how much water is actually available and then you can have potential evapotranspiration which would happen given the temperature there um, if the water was endlessly available so I think more relevant is the actual evapotranspiration where where um, Sahara Desert is, for instance, uh, on zero because uh, there is no water available to start with. Uh, so you can see that the highest evapotranspiration is in parts of uh, New Guinea, Borneo, Java, and then, then the Amazon. So this is the potential evapotranspiration. Uh, so you can see the, the differences in water supply causing these uh, differences between potential and actual evapotranspiration. So when you have potential and actual evapotranspiration, if you, if you subtract these two, then you will get a water surplus or deficit, basically whether in the area is, uh, uh, you have more water falling, then it will be uh, that area losing by evapotranspiration or, or not. So when you look at Southeast Asia as an example, the violet color here is extreme water surplus. So these areas, uh, despite having the highest uh, potential, highest actual evapotranspiration, they are still getting um, even more water than they can uh, they can take. Evapotranspiration is a very good measure um, for for vegetation, and as such, it is uh, correlated with net primary productivity of vegetation. So when you when I'm flipping between these two maps you can see that it's the patterns is pretty much pretty much corresponding when we look at uh, net primary productivity not only on the continents but also in the oceans then first of course we see that the productivity in the ocean is much smaller on per meter square basis um, but also we see interesting a, a reversal of the latitude and gradients while um, the net primary productivity here measured in kilograms of carbon um, uh, integrated in, in a, a plant biomass per square meter and year. Um, while here we see the expected latitudinal gradient towards tropical maximum uh, on the continents, then um, in the oceans, the relatively highest values, which are here blue, are in the temperate and polar regions and uh, nearby the the edge of the continents. Okay, why is that? Well, because in the oceans, um, the productivity is, uh, is uh, constrained by nutrients and nutrients can be either washed away from the continents or they can be brought from the sediments by upwelling um, currents. And these happen in the Northern and Southern latitudes. And so um, while tropical uh, areas are extremely productive uh, on the uh, on the ground, then these are called uh, ocean deserts uh, um, because the ocean productivity is extremely low there. When we look at different ecosystems, then their net primary productivity um, uh, is highly variable, of course, and 
uh, here the swamps and marshes are the most productive terrestrial ones uh, with tropical rainforest coming second, that's per square meter. But then we also have to consider the, the land area of this ecosystem. So if we multiply the intensity with area, we will still get uh, tropical rainforests as the uh, highest uh, primary producers. Um, and then marshes come completely insignificant because of the small land area and the temperate forests come, uh, come second. Um, there is a difference between um, primary productivity and standing biomass. Some ecosystems tend to accumulate biomass, uh, some of them do not. And so the standing biomass is, of course, the highest in the forests, which are real accumulators of biomass. And so that's why especially tropical forests have the highest uh, reserves of uh, standing biomass from terrestrial ecosystems. When we look at the marine ecosystems, they are very different. There, the algae uh, uh, beds and reefs are uh, actually the highest producers comparable with terrestrial marshes. But um, unlike um, uh, tropical forests, uh, these tropical ecosystems are extremely limited in size. And so their role in the global budget is negligible. Um, on the other hand, the least productive open ocean because of its vast um, uh, area is by far the most important producer um, uh, in the oceans. And actually after tropical rainforest, the second most productive uh, biome globally. Um, marine ecosystems uh, do not typically accumulate biomass except again for algae beds and coral reefs. And so the, <clears throat> the biomass, the standing biomass is, is negligible. And um, even for the entire oceans, uh, it's pretty much nothing compared to the uh, terrestrial ecosystems. This is just a reminder of a basic ecology textbook of biomes, uh, which can be mapped on the annual precipitation against annual temperature uh, map. And again, that um, the evapotranspiration, the actual evapotranspiration is um, uh, correlated with net, net primary production ac uh, across these biomes. Um, the evapotranspiration is also correlated with biodiversity in different ways, although typically there is a degree of saturation where, where further increase in evapotranspiration no longer has positive effect on biodiversity. Now we will uh, finally mention a few um, climatic disturbances. One is hurricanes. Um, every single hurricane is unpredictable, but uh, when you think about it as a fact of life in the tropics, then um, over the lifespans of trees, for instance, it becomes a very pred predictable event. This is an example of the frequency of uh, hurricanes um, in, the, in the Lesser Antilles. Um, every bar is the number per 10 years. And so this is actually, um, this is actually 350 years uh, time series. And you can see that for the lifespan of tree, uh, which is several uh, decades, uh, it's pretty much uh, clear that there will be hurricanes uh, in, uh, in the tree's life. And so, although individually unpredictable, it is uh, a very predictable on the life, uh, lifetime scale, and therefore the forests there are <clears throat> adapted to, to hurricanes. Another disturbance uh, um, is, is volcanic activity, uh, which is centered on the um, on the uh, margins of continental plates. Uh, and um, <clears throat> there are a few major areas. Um, one is so-called Pacific Rim of Fire, which is basically circling Pacific Ocean. And then another one is uh, the African Rift uh, coming uh, all the way to Southern Europe. In the tropics, uh, the volcanic activity can actually um, uh, have important effects. It's a, it's a major factor for, uh, it's a major factor for um, a primary succession. That means the succession on uh, starting from complete zero, where you have um, a situation when there is no pre-existing soil, which is exactly the situation you get on volcanic ash or lava flows. Related to it are earthquakes, again, the margins of the uh, continental plates. So they basically follow the volcanic activity. This is 
the map of the earthquakes uh, for the last uh, 120 uh, 20 years. Again, Pacific Rim of Fire is, is uh, very prominent here. And then for the volcanic and earthquake activity, earthquakes are actually important uh, for the dynamics of tropical forests, for instance, because um, since uh, in the humid tropics, the soil is always uh, soaked by water, then in the, in the mountainous terrain, a uh, major effect of, uh, land, of, of the uh, earthquakes are landslides. And so, for instance, in the temperate zone, we have the avalanche dynamics, uh, tropical, forests are disturbed by landslides to the same degree as uh, the temperate zone forests are uh, destroyed by, by snow avalanches. You can see strips of, um, strips of missing forests on the slopes of uh, high mountains in, in temperate zone because the avalanche basically cleared the vegetation, open option for secondary succession. The same happens in the tropics where, again, you can see strips of uh, missing rainforest on the slopes of the mountains because there were landslides, um, which, which basically often triggered, often, triggered by, uh, uh, often triggered by earthquakes, which again stripped um, the forest and started either secondary or primary succession, depending whether some soil was left after the landslide or not. Needless to say that they are also dangerous for people and uh, a significant part of mortality caused by earthquake in the tropics is uh, villages getting, getting buried under, under the unexpected landslides. For the volcanic activity, this is an example of the Manam volcano on the north uh, coast of uh, Papua New Guinea. I, I chose it because that's where we are taking our students from University of South Bohemia and, and from Papua New Guinea for field excursion. So you can see some of the primary succession on the, on the ash flows uh, of the volcano. This is another nice example of uh, volcanic activity from, from New Guinea. This is from Rabaul, where um, this was, um, Rabaul was uh, founded as the capital city of um, German New Guinea, which uh, was a colony started uh, more than 100 years ago by Germany. And um, you can see this is the German club in Rabaul in, this, in these days. And it's a very pittoresque, very nice uh, area. And it's one of the best deep water harbors in the whole Pacific. And that was the reason why, why it was designated as the capital city. Unfortunately, uh, Germans um, being um, from, from Central Europe, where, where uh, there is no volcanic activity whatsoever, did not sufficiently appreciate that um, the, uh, what they call Simpson Hafen, that means Simpson's Harbor, is actually a um, collapsed caldera of a huge um, volcano, which, um, which was flooded uh, probably about uh, 1500 um, years ago, and then um, so they set up the, the capital city in between five uh, active volcanic cones. Two of them you can see here, Taburwur and Vulcan. Of course, it didn't end well. Um, and then after some incidents, uh, there came 1994, where, where Taburwur started very significant volcanic activity. And so this was the <clears throat> Rabaul city. Before that activity, you can see the um, airport here with runway and, and the city around the Simpsonhafen. And then after that activity, most of the city was buried under, under three meters of ash. And unfortunately, it hasn't recovered uh, since then. So this is the situation right after the volcanic activity uh, where um, the ash accumulated on the roofs of the buildings, which collapsed after its weight. And so finally, this is how, how the city looked uh, shortly after that, um, after evacuation. And uh, this was the airport terminal right after the end of the volcanic activity. And I was just uh, going there uh, last month, and this is how the terminal looks, like, uh, looks, looks na uh, now. So this is after almost 30 years, again, indicating how slow it can be the uh, primary succession. You can see the, uh, the runway here, and this is 
uh, we are now driving right uh, on the runway uh, early this year. However, uh, in some places, the primary succession goes much faster. This is the actual, um, uh, this is the actual caldera which emitted the ash. And uh, so right after the end of the activity, it started, the succession started, and this is how it looks now. So this is a secondary vegetation after, uh, after uh, almost 30 years. Okay, so we have got through uh, abiotic conditions. Thank you for your attention.